welcome to Hong Kong and to Hong Kong. You, I gather this is the fourth time you've been to Hong Kong. Right. Yeah, and you love this place, right? Yes. Absolutely, that's great. We well, hope you come back often. I think you know, it would be great for me just to check the audience a little bit to see how much they know about today's <laughs> event. I'm just curious, how many of you have heard of Bach's Art of Few? Can you put your hands up? Okay. And how oh, many wow. of you have heard the piece in its entirety in one go? Ah. And how many of you can play it? Ah. <laughs> so today, <laughs> because of course tomorrow's event uh, is going to be a, a performance of Bach's Art of Fugue. And this is actually it's quite a rare kind of event because there are not many places in the world that we can actually do this with an audience that can really take it because it's actually quite uh, a highly concentrated work, let's put it that way, that demands lots of concentration from both the pianist and also from the audience. So I'm very glad that you're here and that we could talk about this uh, particular work. But maybe before we go into uh, Bach's Art of Fugue, maybe you can share a little bit, Constantine, about your attraction to Bach, because you do play a lot of Bach, and you seem to play it very well. So what is it about Bach that draws you as a pianist to this music? Well, I'm. Um, hello, everybody. I am, um, of course, constantly asked this question, and it always is a difficult question for me. It is pretty much as impossible for me to explain why I'm um, attracted by Bach as somebody who likes to be in a forest to say why he or she needs to go to the forest or why do you need to go to the to the sea or you know there's so much part of a natural feeling already like. You don't think how you breathe or why you drink a glass of water. So this is uh, this is what Bach music has grown uh, to become to me, uh, for better or for worse. And uh, that's why I am uh, here um, today and also tomorrow to present Out of the Fugue. Yeah, so really Bach to you is just like breathing. <laughs> it's just part of your in DNA of how you, you do that. I can hear that in the way you kind of play this music mm -hmm. in a very uh, uh, extraordinary natural way, actually. It's extraordinary. But let's go talk a little bit about the uh, Art of Fugue then. Uh, this is a, a piece that Bach wrote very late in his life uh, and, is, in fact, is a work that in many ways... Uh, is a summation of all that he's been doing in compositional, uh, in his compositions, and also a kind of summation of what his own life is about in many ways. So I'm curious what, how you interpret Bach's Art of Fugue and you know, your, your feelings about this particular piece. Well, let me begin um, just by telling once again a well-known fact that probably most of you know that the name Art of the Fugue was not given to this piece by Bach himself. This was given by either his son or, the, or his son-in-law or whoever else it could have been um, because uh, Kunst, the Kunst der Fuge is the original title in German, was very much uh, in fashion in fact uh, in that period. I mean there was a lot of it was a time when the sciences were really flourishing and there were a lot of important scientific discoveries that we continue to enjoy to the present days. And Bach was actually elected a member of that scientific society and this was meant to be his contribution and on a musical level and that's why my very important dear teacher Rosalind Turek was uh, really in her Bach uh, Turek uh, Center in Oxford. She was really inviting people from the fields that have absolutely nothing to do with music, such as chemistry or physics or um, uh, math, uh, maths or botanics or biology and so on and so forth. And all these people were trying to establish a connection between all these sciences and uh, Bach's music with music as such as a f as a scientific phenomenon and not not an not a part of the, the division of the arts i think bach was uh, i'm not sure if he would actually be pleased with that name art of the fugue if he really can see because bach art as such really transcends uh, every possible art it makes art uh, Sort of useless as a word, and and, 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 and a bit of a bit pointless actually, and that uh, is what is so in incredible about 
especially late Bach, that uh, it becomes really so original, so uh, such a natural and organic process as we are enjoying a rain or we are enjoying a bit of sun after after long winter. And uh, yeah, it is in this vein that I try to present this work, really not as out of the fugue, but as a, a certain uh, um, theater piece in a way, in a sort of kind of musical theater. And uh, this, you know, because both these words, art and the fugue, are already quite kind of forbidding. And that is what I try to overcome, and I want you to enjoy this music in a slightly less uh, or let me say rather unsophisticated uh, level uh, such as uh, let's say Brandenburg concertos or the or the English French suites or the, uh, the violin partitas and cello suites and so on so really an amuse an amusement entertainment music in the highest sense so like Bach himself wrote in his forward to the partitas just to l lighten up the spirit and of the music lovers not necessarily the musicians themselves so this is a mu music to please as it were a music that brings uh, lightness and joy I would like this uh, uh, to bring lightness and joy because I think it is that is a really uh, the most difficult way it is very easy for all of us in the stressful lives that we have to react with dramatic sense. I mean, there's a lot of drama in in this uh, particular work, which I don't want to undiminish, but I would really like, uh, I'm happy if uh, my audience leaves the whole lot with the feeling, oh, this is such a heavy, this is such a formidable piece and uh, how how can we digest all this and how can we continue to live with this tragedy and, and, and I think it is um, tragedy in a Greek sense of words so not just a sad story or story without any hope uh, because life uh, is a hopeless story it ends up uh, with death just like this piece but uh, that is not uh, my point my point is really for the audience to feel uh, that they've been relieved, that they've been comforted. Maybe you can explain a little bit about why you think this piece is about death, because the audience may not know the story. Well, this is um, officially incompleted work. It was interrupted by Bach's own death. Um, the missing uh, part where the original theme, which is really the seed of this whole, uh, in all its developments, it is really similar to the embryo uh, developing in the womb of the mother and then going through all the life cycles, all the ages of life, and then embracing the death, uh, which is not necessarily a negative uh, thing here, is maybe a comforter, also like it is part of uh, Bach's religion, also to see death. Uh, if you look at the texts of his cantatas, and I would say 80% of them are dealing with the subject of death and uh, in a, sometimes in a philosophical, sometimes in religious way and sometimes it's just a, as existential way of something that one can hope that that will uh, stop all the sufferings. Yeah, like uh, this is, uh, I love this uh, line by Woody Allen who says, life is full of anguish, pain and suffer and on top of it all, it's also too short. <laughs> so, so that is, I think, um, a little bit the connotation behind that. Um, yes, yeah, so it uh, it is interrupted, and uh, it was Bach's son, Carl Philipp Emanuel, a very important uh, composer in uh, the sentimentalist style. A lot of it we can feel in, light, uh, in late uh, Bach, especially in... Um, uh, a musical offering, but also in the art of the fugue and uh, the big B minor mass uh, that he was actually under influence of his younger uh, children, Carl Philipp Emanuel, and even uh, Johann Christian, who was, of course, writing in a Viennese classical style. He was, uh, uh, in a way, a teacher of Mozart. So all of this, uh, this smooth transition to a classical style, classical in parentheses, is uh, is all traceable here, so we can uh, feel how Beethoven, especially late Beethoven, was impressed. 
by Bach. Uh, the very last fugue from the first set, the number 11, is really uh, very similar to the fugue from the Diabelli variations and a lot of uh, passages from the Missa Solemnis. So uh, that makes a really a smooth transition into Beethoven's era and even beyond that into Romanticism and further on to the 20th century and to our present day, the 21st century. That is why it is such a universal piece that we can trace both directions. Like I mentioned, very, very far forward and I don't know how many centuries still we will be under the direct influence of it just sense of development, the keys and the shapes and the uh, uh, articulation and uh, every possible component of musical uh, writing. But also, of course, very much uh, uh, back to the previous periods before Bach, all the way to the Gregorian chant, something that we can feel in the last chorale, the piece that, like I said, Carl Philippe Emmanuel decided to compensate, that's his own words, this loss that the composer was uh, prevented from finishing his most daring achievement. So this, when this Tower of Babel, which is this quadruple fugue, is kind of collapses, we hear this uh, wonderful and simple and yet very complex uh, chorale that gives us this uh, sense of achievement and, uh, and comfort, a very moving moment in the whole history of music, I think. So in, in this um, uh, piece, this um, uh, masterpiece, really, the, uh, the, the curious thing is, you know, the, Bach is writing this extraordinary, probably going to be a, a, a quadruple fugue. So he gets to the third part, and then he puts his own name, right, in the music, because B-A-C-H is B-flat, A-C, B-natural. And then it just stops, right? It just stops in mid-sentence at that point. Yes, this is the third subject, the, and the fourth is meant to be the original, the seed. Yes. And that, that the complete flourishing of the tree he was not uh, to achieve, and uh, so that is what we're left with. We're just left with this moment, as yes. it were, where Bach has put his name there, and then he's, he's, he's no longer able to finish that. So uh, C.P. Bach, Carl Philipp Emanuel, writes in the, in, in the manuscript, and at this point, you know, when the composer introduces his name, B-A-C-H, uh, as the counter-subject to the fugue, the composer died. And then, of course, uh, in, the, in the, uh, the publication of the uh, Art of Fugue, a year later after Bach's death, uh, they include uh, this uh, chorale, this Lutheran hymn, uh, which is supposed to be uh, Bach's, uh, f uh, uh, something that he dictated on his deathbed, right? So he was basically dying, and then he says, I want to uh, dictate this particular piece as my final act. And that's what you're going to play as well. Right. Yeah, so, so it's actually a very powerful piece about uh, the meaning of death. So in many ways, the art of fugue is an art of dying uh, for Bach, but in the Lutheran tradition, so it's a, it's a, it's a way of affirming faith. Mm -hmm. That's why you say it's not about, oh, this is so heavy, and this is so, you know, about death. It's more about an affirmation in one way of the, the goodness of the cosmos and of truth exactly. and of beauty. So it's an extraordinary piece. But the piece itself is um, also extraordinary in its complexity, even though actually it sounds extraordinary, you know, I wouldn't say it sounds simple, but it's very pleasing. Uh, the, the, the way it's made, the way it's constructed is extremely uh, uh, complicated, and it really is art in all its artfulness, actually. I don't know whether you want to talk a little bit about um, how this uh, piece, which has, I don't know how many, how many, uh, how many movements are you going to be playing all together? Is it about... Oh, it's about, uh, it's uh, 22. 22, right. 11, so 11 intermission and, and 11, including yeah. the chorale. Yeah, um, I would never agree with um, Albert Schweitzer, who said that uh, this piece reminds him of a sort of very uh, spooky and uh, sort of grey autumn day, and like an, uh, sort of an etching, and as opposed to to full blood, uh, you know, oil painting. I think that piece is full of very intricate uh, and very exquisite beauties, and sometimes it takes uh, a bit of challenge to discover, or just a lot of 
a lot of time really to start to enjoy these things, which I try to really unfold and develop in my performances. Uh, yes, uh, if we take this name again, quite literally, out of the fugue, so the, so the fugue means actually running or escaping. So we can also look at this as the art of escaping. Yeah, <laughs> which is uh, how which is I what like. he did. <laughs> yes. It's, would you like to maybe explain at the piano a little bit about oh, yes. uh, this uh, piece? Because basically it is based on one theme or one subject, few subjects. As we well, uh, these two uh, late important works, the musical offering and Out of the Fugue, are really opposed to each other in a way that in musical offering Bach is offered a very, very sophisticated and complex theme by the King of Prussia, Frederick the Great. And um, he was asked to improvise the sixth part, Richard Carr, on the spot, I'll, you know. Uh, and he couldn't do that uh, because it was uh, beyond even his capacities. He, he did a sixth part, Richard Carr, on his own theme, but then he did uh, complete the order of the king and he presented it. With Art of the Fugue, it's the opposite story because here we are dealing with a very rudimentary, very simple motif, but it has a, an extreme potential, and that's what allows Bach to go through all these stages that I've mentioned. And so the theme, I'm going to play it uh, for you. So as you, as you can see, it's a very simple uh, subject. It's sort of dealing around. So this is the tonal D minor uh, triad, and then a little cadenza, and that's it basically. But what a uh, what a fundament for this for this. It's amazing what he does yes. <laughs> with something as simple as that. Yes. In fact, so the first four um, uh, pieces, as it were are really what we would call simple fugues, which are not very simple. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you can talk a little bit about what, you know, when Bach begins this process, what he's actually doing to this theme. Well, indeed, uh, Bach works, uh, groups his uh, fugues, his uh, counterpoints, as he calls them here, to the point uh, he only calls the fugue the very last, the quadruple fugue, which is not achieved, of course. But the rest of them are called counterpoint, whether by Bach himself or, or by his son, or by by the editor, we don't know. But um, in fact, he's very consequent and very logical in the development, in the uh, gradual complication of this theme. So uh, the first um, fugue is really based on that motive that I've just played for you. And it finishes up very abruptly with the three very powerful chords before the final recitativo comes in. So that already underlines that uh, nature of abruptness, of as if Bach would foresee that he would be prevented from achieving it. And it is that motive of the sudden rest, sudden pauses, kind of breathless uh, quality uh, poses is, uh, is, is quite impressive from the very first piece, as you can see. And then he goes to the fugue number two, which basically deals with the same very motive, except that from the smooth movement of the quavers, he goes to a very abrupt and very powerful pointed dotted rhythms, which very often in Bach's music, especially in his passion music, is associated with the suffering of Jesus. Um. really more uh, of a character development, but not the development of the structure itself. If we see music as a structure and a character, um, then you would uh, probably understand uh, what I mean. And then he goes to uh, the uh, counterpoint number three, where he starts with the same direction of the theme. Um, no, sorry, there he goes 
um, two steps further, not just one step further. Not only he inverses the theme, so instead of going up and then down and then up again and then down, he, he goes the opposite way. So the easiest would be just to change that like he does in counterpoint number four. But he reserves that for one step further and he actually goes uh, another direction. So he also transposes the theme to its answer, which normally would, how the theme would appear the second time, not the first time. which is a, a very smart and very clever go, of course, because that allows him to finish again on the, on the tonic, uh, in the, on the tone D again. Uh, and then, uh, as we uh, listen to the number three further, uh, Bach actually complicates the theme, which is something that only happens in block three again. So you see he always works on, on the seamless as seamless as it as it appears, he always works on a very very multi-leveled um, tasks at the same time simultaneously, and that that makes it so more exp uh, more impressive. So he actually goes at some point. And even more complex and more elaborate. Which so he's basically filling in yes. the intervals yes, to create exactly. a, uh, to exactly. elaborate that yes. theme. The passing tones that yes. makes it more cantable, uh, more singing, and uh, kind of less austere. Uh, and then uh, the number four is just a simple inversion, but as simple as it is, this is really one of the most delightful pieces, also one of the very last pieces that he composed. He actually edited a lot, especially the endings of the fugues. But that last uh, uh, counterpoint four, the last one of the first block, is really what I was trying to describe as the art overcoming every effort and becoming just the sheer beauty of the music. motif like a kind of a cuckoo motif uh, is really the the key element to this one so it is it is really as much descriptive music as uh, rappel des oiseaux by rameau and the, the all the later that they so you hear nature in this yes, uh, the nice. cuckoo and uh, <laughs> so all the environments you know this 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 french harpsichord school which yes. is very much the environment in which Bach, uh, out of which Bach developed his own uh, keyboard style. So he's able to represent, as it were, yes. different uh, yes. uh, images yes. of nature in yes. that view. That's a great way of thinking about it. So that's the first block that we've covered here. So this is the simple block, but already you can see that Bach is manipulating one simple theme in very complex ways, to, you know, inverting it and then filling it in, in, in that way. And then it gets more complicated, right? Um, the next block of, uh, of three uh, c counterpoints, as it were, um, where he begins to do very uh, sophisticated things uh, now with this theme that uh, you know, it's amazing that he can do this and the music still works. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about what happens next in the second block. Yes, now we have a second block of only three pieces as opposed to four. Four in the first block, four in the third block, and three in between, something that might remind us of an altar piece. If you think of a great masterpiece in Ghent Cathedral, for example, that is really constructed in a similar way, where we have very large outer parts that you can close, the middle really the most sacral and the more, most intimate piece. So the very central piece, I'm jumping a little bit forward, that would be the number six, which is the central uh, um, counterpoint from, the, from that very first set of progressing 11 fugues, is an extremely powerful uh, um, piece in the French rhythm Stilo Francese, what the original score says. So a lot of dotted rhythms really in a, 
uh, genre of French overture, which was very, of course, very important for Bach. If we think of French overture itself, or the Goldberg Variation Number no. 16, or the Fourth Partita, not to mention his orchestral suites and a lot, a lot, a lot of pieces in his cantatas and so on. Uh, but uh, first, the number five, uh, like I said, it picks up from number three with its passing tones. So you can feel the... You can feel uh, uh, how Bach actually incrustates this little, little important note, but then he already with the second, uh, with the answer of the theme, he goes the opposite direction. So so far we were dealing only with one direction, whether direct or inversed one, but here we have a combination of both. Moreover, Bach steps on the heels of the theme. So once again. He doesn't get a chance for the theme to really finish, but he intrudes, interrupts with the opposite. And so on. So you he continues to uh, work like this on a very elaborate and very interesting harmonic levels. We see a lot of enharmonism anticipating Chopin and even Richard Wagner here. And then the number five is, is this very powerful central piece, the French uh, style. Okay, hold on. Now we have this diminishing of the theme. So not only Bach opposes the themes, but he actually gives them in, in, in a double time. So this is what happens is two times smaller, just like you, what you have in these Chinese ivories, where every next ball has a different pattern and is also fitted inside. So he shrunk the theme. Yes. Right. So once again... in a fascinating and incredible way with these two different uh, tempi, in fact. One uh, being twice as fast or twice as slow, uh, depending on the contract context. And then the last one of this middle block, the number seven, is, of course, is f further more complex because now Bach deals with dimin diminishing and augmenting the theme at the same time. So it gets smaller and also gets bigger. Yes. And also same remains at the so same it, length. It kind of, it's kind of an <laughs> optic thing. I think the nearest to look at this would be really astronomy, where you know all these celestial bodies, you know, the stars and the planets, really depend on where, who, uh, which one of them you compare. If you put uh, Earth next to Sun, of course, it's extremely small. But if you put a little, little satellite, for example, the moon already, then it is much smaller than the, than the Earth. So this relationship is, uh, is what the music tries and uh, achieves. Uh, it's amazing like. you say that, because obviously, you know, you, if you think of all these different uh, celestial motion of the stars, mm -hmm. that was exactly when, why Bach joined that scientific society, exactly. you know, to understand that this is the music of the spheres, but right? the music, this music represents the movement of the planets, and it's therefore a kind of uh, a microcosm of the cosmos. So he's yes. actually creating a little world in music, exactly. and it's extraordinary. Yes. So, uh, and what is what is what is even more amazing that we don't need to get a magnifying glasses or microscopes or uh, telescopes really to to look at these things. You know, that we just we just listen and they, they and, and, and it's themselves. beautiful at the same time.
and incredibly hard to um, play too, I imagine. <laughs> Well, it took, <laughs> took me a while. <laughs> I wasn't born with this. So this yeah. this augmented theme, really huge and uh, formidable as it is, goes subsequently from the bass to the tenor to the alto and to the sopran voices. So far, we've been dealing with four voices, all uh, the seven counterpoints. And so most striking is the, nu uh, the number eight, which is the first one of the final uh, block of the oh yes, four. the next block. Yes, yes, of the first of the first half, of the prop counterpoint part proper. Yes, and so this is a, a block of another type of fugue, which is uh, double, triple, and triple types of fugue. I don't know whether you want to explain what those are. <laughs> yes, so the number eight is uh, a triple uh, fugue, and it also is a th three-part fugue. So first time we are dealing not with four but three voices, and the reason. Uh, well, uh, to say it better, uh, we don't even notice that it's one voice less because the structure is so complex and so so intricate that uh, we hardly miss that voice. Pretty much in the same um, uh, manner as a Beethoven who writes string trios and we never notice that it's not a quartet because the writing is so clever. So in a similar way, we're dealing here with something totally new. And like I mentioned, the musical theater, it is a very, very powerful appearance of something to of a totally different figure, a totally different character. So the theme number two so far goes like this. But of course, you can see that this will fit uh, to the to the, our original because, uh, uh, harmonically speaking, and Bach, even if he writes only one voice, he's always thinking also in terms of vertical, not just horizontal. So these are uh, extra themes that will match, yes. that will harmonize with the original theme. Exactly, but Bach prefers not to introduce this theme eventually, as you would have expected him to do. He goes in media res, he goes immediately really two, three steps further with this new th subject. And the subject number two is not our theme either. It's, it's a new uh, theme. And that's the theme that when you will reverse it much later on, will also give us B-A-C-H, which is the first uh, quotation of his own name. In a very discreet manner so far, it's still a long way to go till the last fugue, but it's already there, such as we can feel the important traces in the embryo when we look in the ultrasound uh, picture of the future baby, or when we can feel uh, some very grown-up um, features also in a, in a newborn baby. So he's maybe. Sort of planting seeds, yes. as it were. Yes, so it is, really, it is really extraordinary how, how Bach, Bach anticipates certain things in the in a very discreet and very, uh, yeah, very impressive, impressively, uh, impressively restrained way also, because that incredible sense of measure never really, he never challenges that. He's, he's always, he never says too much also, and not, never says too early. Mm. So, and only as the last we get to hear the new version. of our original seed theme and uh, that is the longest and the complexest um, fugue so far the number eight then we go to number nine which is a double fugue is a kind of recreational fugue is a very easy going it starts again uh, with, an, with a new object so that would be the number four so far. And only a bit later we get to hear um, the main theme as, a, as a, a counterpoint, as a double theme. This is, in fact, is a double theme, the number nine. Um, number 10 is again uh, based on the same model except that it already connects us rhythmically to the original or new original theme. And the number 11 again.
follows the same rhythmical pattern. So again, a very delicate and uh, extremely intelligent and clever way of bringing these hidden interwoven uh, threads together so that the whole carpet, musical carpet, really has this solid, sol solidness and uh, incredible integrity. So that ends your first half that ends, of the concert, as it were, the, before the interval. Uh, so you've got uh, the introduction for um, fugues that introduces the theme, and then you have then three fugues that sort of stretches it, in, you know, and then makes it smaller, and then puts it all together, and then another block of four that um, basically introduces new themes, right, around that theme. Exactly, and yeah. just to say a couple of words about the very last uh, mm -hmm. counterpoint from the first set, yes. number 11, this one actually starts with the main theme, so in reverse, the theme yes. re it, it uses the same uh, material as the number eight, so it has this in, uh, inner hidden s s symmetry. So like I said, that's the new mask of our old friend. And then the number two uh, is again this, what we had Number 11 in reverse. And then. Ah, so that's, that's the BACH. That's the first, that's the first mention of ah, the BACH. Right, right. As you, can, as you can see, completely hidden. It takes a while really to discover it. You don't, if you listen to the first or second time, you probably will not notice this <laughs> unless you're really sort of pointed out to this. And then um, the third theme again is the... Uh, the reverse of that. Um, and uh, character-wise speaking, that number 11 is, is extremely powerful and almost on the verge of aggressivity. Um, a little bit similar with the concluding choral from the first ha first part of the St. Uh, Matthew Passion, using actually the same rhythm. So, speaking of the person who is supposed to regret the sins committed, so a very powerful and very direct message from the Bach and. Uh, then the intermission is really necessary because the, <laughs> the, sheer, uh, the sheer volume and the sheer intensity is really almost too much to take. Yeah. So you kind of see this as a, as a spiritual journey as well that Bach is going on. In, in, oh, with in Bach it is always a spiritual journey. Mm. We all have our own spiritual journeys. That you cannot pinpoint it because it's a very individual experience, of course. Yes, in music it would be difficult to, to exactly pinpoint it. But there is definitely something there that is, you know, that is uh, asking theological questions, let's put it that way, or, or, or those kinds of issues that are being raised. Well, Bach was uh, teaching theology. Mm -hmm. He was, was preaching it in his music he, in one when sense. He was, no, but uh, in, apart from uh, preaching in his music, mm -hmm. when, in his early days when um, he was working at St. Thomas School in mm -hmm. uh, Leipzig, this was part of his duty to That's teach right. the children the Latin and the theology. Yes. So his library was full of these theological books, which probably have contradicted each other just as uh, his structures sometimes contradict. Yes. And in fact, many of those books uh, contain many sermons about thinking about your death. It's one of the big themes in Lutheran thought. Um, so we will have, then there's an interval, obviously, because we've just had this massive, <laughs> aggressive fugue. And, and then comes, I suppose, uh, what is some of the most remarkable pieces of counterpoint, because it's just uh, so, I, well, you, I don't know how Bach managed to write it. It's a little bit, I, I'm sitting right here, and I'm seeing Constantine, and I can see his reflection right, uh, in uh, the upper part of this piano. And basically what Bach does is exactly the same thing, but with music. So he's written what we, we call a mirror fugue. Uh, and maybe you want to describe what a mirror fugue is. Well, here, uh, mirror, f of course, like with every reflection, we're dealing with pair. It's me paired to my own reflection, or when anybody of you would go to the mirror, you would... Uh, have your other self 
behind that that mirror, which is uh, sort of what the Alice uh, in uh, Wonderland uh, is Alice based Wonderland, on. Yes. It's all about a mirror, isn't it? Beyond the beyond the looking glass. Yes. So um, just to first, I play the both theme together. They don't sound simultaneously, but so you will understand better how it works. Bach only starts with one voice in the first fugue, so you can notice that he also changes the pattern. We, so far we only had the square 4-4 four, four meter or a la breve meter, and now we have a triple meter, one, two, three, so he elongates the second beat, makes it long pretty much in the sense of saraband. Only with one voice, without this incredible richness. Very simple, almost primitive. So of course, now the second voice comes one step, one step up. And so on. Of course, in the reverse, it will be one step down. In fact, Bach really only wrote one piece, and then he just sort of did the mirror version. Exactly. And it's exactly the same, yes. so he actually it didn't have to do very much. But it had to work. <laughs> it has to work, <laughs> that's the point. That's so it's like point. you know, putting all this ink down here and then turning the page like this, and, and then you, only you get two pieces. <laughs> yes, exactly. And in these both mirrors, uh, this pair of mirror fugues, he also, like I said, he never only tries one aspect. It is always at least two or more by him. So uh, other than uh, what we just described, this phenomenon of, uh, of the reflection, he also changes his theme. He feels it even more elaborately. We only hear it in a way I played to you for one time in every voice, and then he goes to a new version. And that makes uh, the character extremely uh, prostrate, extremely uh, elevated, lofty. Um, in fact, I see these uh, two pieces as uh, something extraterrestrial, whether you are walking on the bottom of a deep sea or whether you gravitate in the open space. But these are the, these are the feelings that I somehow sense and uh, I try to transmit it. Well, I th that's how I feel when you play it. I feel like you, you've sort of stretched something in midair, and it's just held there. Yeah. Extraordinary. I like this timeless and spaceless yes. and gravityless uh, sense about these pieces. The next pair of again the reverse fugues is exact opposition to this. is very much down to earth, very cheerful, and uh, very uh, interesting uh, variant variation on the theme again. Alter, alteration, better to say. Bach never speaks of variations and as such. Even the Goldberg variations, he calls them Veränderungen, which means alterations. I think it's a more of a magical process, really transforma magical mm. transformation of things. More like alchemy rather than yes, creation. Yes. Yes. So the, it starts with the reverse form, presented in this way. the uh, counterpart to this is so here he doesn't just change the direction like I said in the previous pair 
completely opposite direction. Here he actually swaps the voices on top of that. So again, one th thing on top of the other. So what was, it's kind of a rotation thing. What was the lower voice becomes an upper voice. The middle part goes to the, to uh, to the bottom and, the, and the, the middle one goes up again. So not just Miro, but let's say a, a wicked Miro when we look at these Miros that transform yeah, it's a wobbly one. One of these. What do you call them in those fairgrounds? You know, one of these. Yes, uh, exactly. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes, yes. And it's also in th this one is also three voices. This this is of course also three yes. voices. Otherwise, it would would have been really unplayable. Actually, he wrote it for four voices for two keyboards. Yes. And uh, I cannot do this tomorrow, or I can never do it in a concert. But I've done it in a recording, playing back with my own self. Yes. So how does so that work? You're playing. Uh, well, you're just you adding make, an. You extra. make a ground version with just two voices, and then you add two other uh, voices to ah, that. Right, right. And okay. of course, it has to fit musically and rhythmically, wow. which is which is not easy. Yes. Yes. So th those, as it were, two pieces become four pieces because it's of the mirror, yes. uh, and that forms another block. That's that's the end of another block. Exactly. So that's really the most sophisticated block, really, in, in one sense, in terms of ingenuity. Yes. Um, and then the the final block then uh, would be a series of what are labeled canons, which are, uh, maybe you want to explain what canons are. Yeah, so the mirror fugues are really the, f the final fugues, except the uh, unaccomplished, the last fugue. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the rest of the piece, we're dealing with these canons, and it is supposed to be four of them, but actually we have five, because one of the canons, the first canon, uh, was uh, written twice by Bach. Once for the keyboard version on two staves, like mm -hmm. I mentioned, and one on the four staves for string quartet or whatever. But I perform both versions because I think they're show, showing this incredible uh, gift of Bach never to repeat himself, just like nature. And out of the same variation of the theme, Uh, create two completely independent pieces based on the same idea. So not only we are dealing here with a canon as such, canon, uh, you might want to say a couple of words on oh, what canons, canon. yeah, okay. It's very difficult to explain all these counterpoints. But canon, basically, you have one theme, and then, then the same theme appears in a different voice. And, and then when that theme appears in a different voice, obviously the first, uh, you know, the first voice will continue with some different counterpoint. And then that will be followed uh, further by the second voice. So basically they're chasing each other constantly. Uh, and, but of course, these things have to interlock and work. So they're also very clever. Uh, and these, these are quite long canons actually, because yeah, normally canons are quite short, but yeah. these are long ones. Well, Bach uh, eventually swaps the direction and uh, change the roles of the voices, so they have to follow each other in an opposite direction. So again, right. we're dealing with a mirror. Yes. Uh, and uh, in all these four canons, he uses totally different models, different intervals, because these canons, uh, just to say briefly about his art of canons in the Goldberg variations, they're based on this uh, rhythmical pattern. Every third variation is a canon, and he augments the intervals. So he starts with unison, one voice, canon. also adds the bass to it. Here we're dealing with just with canons in the art of the fugue. And then he augments the intervals. He goes, uh, the number three is, is this unison, the number six is the second, third, and so on until he reaches the interval of ninth, the uh, nona. Yes. Uh, and then he goes to quadly. But, but here we're dealing with pure canons in the purest sense and uh, Bach's ingenu ingenuity. So the first canon, which I just played, the one that has two versions is uh, a canon that not only changes the direction in its answer, so it's not, but it's the opposition of this.
and then its opposition in augmentation, so twice as slow. And so on. So a double task again. And then is the second version is exactly the same thing, but a totally different music. So really this abundancy, abundance and uh, never-ending generosity of a creator. He's a very generative composer. I mean, basically Bach is just infinite sort yes. of variety and just conjuring yes. up endless material yes. from the same it's cell. Like, it's like this huge, incredible oak that gives life to birds and insects and new plants and really hosts them all, right. in a sense. The ecological Bach. Yes, yes. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Uh, the next canon is a again more recreational one. It is a very simple one. It is in uh, canon in octave. Again, a new version of the theme. And so on. So very easy to trace, very relaxing uh, for the ear. Canon is um, in the um, tenth. The canon in the tenth. But in the same in, in the same movement as you can feel, and finally the last canon, again a very powerful uh, character change. I have read this is not my uh, discovery that these four canons have been compared to four human temperaments. So the first one uh, is uh, was compared to phlegmatic character with its slow down. Slow, um, uh, slow motion of um, our uh, liquids that we have, and uh, this is the medieval notion of the four humors. Yes. So the phlegm as one. That's the phlegmatic. So that's the phlegmatic, phlegmatic yes. canon. Yes. And then the second one is the second one is choleric one with oh, this moment. Col choleric. With this, okay. With this right. Quick silver. Never, never stopping, always running, and it's actually an endless canon, as they all are. Perpetual motion. Perpetual motion, exactly. Yes. And then the third one is the, 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 the really the middle one, the sanguinic one, where the blood is really sanguine. It's, yes, yeah, your sanguine. This is blood. Sort of more easy going and dancing. Right. And, The final one is oh, a, that's a sad one, then the final the sad one. one, the melancholic one, yes. which is also prepares us. Uh, it has a, even a cadenza, which I like to experiment on. What do you mean? You actually, yeah, uh, I do, I, uh, extemporize yes, at that point, yes, and that prepares us for the perception of the last uh, mm. unaccomplished fugue. That is the one where he actually changes the 
uh, movement, as you could hear, it starts with the bass and then is followed by the upper voice, by the right hand, so to speak. Here and then he changes it. It's the right hand, the upper voice that becomes the the leading one, and the bass follows. And then it stops at a certain point, and then there is this cadenza, uh, followed by the final fugue. And the final fugue is based, of course, on a different theme, which is still somehow related to our main theme. So you could feel this, that again this uh, tonic uh, triad remains really the skeleton of it all, but what is really amazing about this theme is that it uh, can be played both ways, from the beginning to the end and from the end to the beginning in the same way. It's like a palindrome. A palindrome, exactly, yes. which is um, which allows Bach to use his other very sophisticated and important device, this uh, crayfish. Uh, a, a crayfish? Yes. <laughs> this is a new one for me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. Yes, yes. Like a crab. Yeah, the crab. The crab cannon, yes. The crab cannon. Sorry, this is more nature. <laughs> yes. And then the second theme is uh, probably the most emotionally moving part of the whole uh, Art of the Fugue. Um, so that prepares us for the B-A-C-H uh, theme really with the full consciousness so suddenly music interrupts and then we hear this is B-A-C-H yes yeah. that's Bach's name that's Bach's name and uh, it all ends up of course when all the three themes that I've just played happen together so that's uh, pretty much the story. Yes. And, uh, and then it will the just plot. stop in mid-sentence, basically. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And then, uh, we won't do it now, but uh, of course, then you will play that deathbed uh, chorale, that Lutheran hymn, yeah. where Bach is basically... Well, I think there are two, ver there are two possible texts, right? The two possible D texts are one is about the direst need, when we are in the direst need, which can be associated with the hour of death. Yes. And the other one is uh, called uh, For Deinem Thron uh, Tret die Himmel. So with this, herewith, I come to your throne, the throne of, of, uh, yes. of God. And humbly turn your face towards yes. me, uh, yes. a, a miserable sinner, or something like that, yes. yes. So, so this incredible sense of circle without having a circle, such as the Goldberg Variations, for example, have finished with the same material they began with. Mm. We still have that same coming from nothing and going to nowhere. Yes, basically. yes. So it's a, as it were the entire life cycle uh, or the entire cosmos, right, that you have in the Art of Fugue. So this is why it's just such a, in one sense, a powerful work. And, and you, you see it as a kind, of, uh, a kind of battle with death, but also a kind of affirmation of the goodness and truth uh, and the beauty of the world that Bach is also affirming in that in some sense, maybe not. <laughs> yes and no, uh -huh. yes. I think it is, uh, it is really impossible to really describe. Mm. It is something we can sense when we listen to this music. Yes, and, uh, yes, yeah. So we, we have to take our own spiritual journey as we listen to this. So tomorrow, uh -huh. will be our, because it's so seldom, you know, this is really a great opportunity uh, because it's so seldom played as a whole you know, concert that we can sit through the whole art of fugue and experience this journey that you've been describing, uh, but in concert, and that's uh, going to be a great, great pleasure for all of us. Well, thank you so much for you. Uh, taking the time to share all these insights. It's been terrific. Thank you. So let's uh, thank Constantine. Well, I think that's all we have time for uh, this evening. So I'm hoping that you will all be at the concert tomorrow. So I'll see you there. Thank you.